Today's guest is Rosemary Cescolini. I have actually had the privilege of working with Rose in Hire, and I am so excited to bring her to you guys on the podcast today because she is just a force of nature businesswoman from Toronto, Canada. And she has started a podcast called Only Women Entrepreneurs. Um, she has a whole you know, consulting company behind that. Um, and so if you are a woman going into entrepreneurship, you are definitely going to want to listen and definitely check out her podcast and also website. Um, Rose has amazing connections in business. She's a part of quite the, uh, quite the operation up there in Canada. And so she has a lot of really great friends, um, that are incredible leaders, um, uh, in business. So make sure you check that out. So a little bit more about Rose. So she grew up in Canada. Her parents were immigrants from Italy. Um, I actually really, I I personally have noticed that when people are either immigrants to another country where there's more opportunity or uh, their parents were, I just see this like deep appreciation for like, wow, if you just go out and get it, you actually can. Let's freaking go, (laughs) you know? And so I hear some of that in her, um, but she has such a cool story. She was actually a teacher before and she just mm, couldn't stand by some of the political control, I guess, (laughs) in terms of the teaching. So she left that, um, started working in her father-in-law's business, making interior and exterior doors. So she's like, here I am, this like, young woman like okay i guess i can do this and wow um it's now a multi-million dollar business three decades of doing that and she is now reaching out the hand and showing helping young women showing them uh, through the podcast and through the services on their website like how you can do this how you can do this we get into what it's like to be in male dominated fields with which both of us can definitely relate to um and just some really great nuggets of wisdom so uh make sure you check out the website onlywomenentrepreneurs.com and um you can see all the courses podcasts all of that on there and we'll link up her social media as well last thing if you have not yet checked out my coach tara app i'm making a little plug for that it is going really well we have a lot of people in there now there are active you know comments and forums you can participate in and ask me any questions you like if you're looking for some help with training either at home or in the gym nutrition keto or non-keto there's a mindset section where i take you through some 22 minute guided journeys and also a biohacking section that we're really starting to build out now that i'm very excited about so um, you can check that all out for free for seven days. Just go to terragarrison.com slash app and you can get all the details on that. All righty, guys, let's go ahead and dive in. Here is Rosemary Cescolini. Okay, so Rose, only women entrepreneurs. I'm excited to dive in because you've you've been in the business scene for a minute and you've done really well in business. And, you know, as we've been working together um, on... <sighs> you know, you told me early on that what you really wanted to focus on in this chapter of your life is leaving a legacy. You know, you've kind of built right. a lot of awesomeness for yourself and your family. And your desire was to help young women who are coming into entrepreneurship. And can you share with us why that appeals to you? Why does that matter to you? Well, it matters to me because um, I became the person I am simply because I had a lot of uh, mentors growing up mm. and they showed me the way and then um, it's for me to return a favor. Um, mm. I'm very grateful for my life. I've been uh, very satisfied personally and professionally. And all around me, I'm seeing a young generation frustrated, sad, a uh, little hope. And they think there's really nothing uh, to life. And we have issues with alcoholism and drugs suicides. And I feel for me just to kind of wrap up my chapter in life and go out and retire, it's not the right thing to do. So I had an inner calling to actually serve. Okay. Let's talk about this because I have noticed being an entrepreneur myself, sometimes I'll talk to, I was about to say boys, um, (laughs) young men, (laughs) Right. Sorry, guys. Young men, um, or you know, kind of in that like eighteen to twenty-two, twenty to twenty-five, somewhere in that range, right? Right. And I've noticed that 
it used to be like, I want to be like Mike, like people wanted to be athletes or people wanted to be a doctor or like all these things. And now it's like Gary V and, you know, Tony Robbins. And like, it's like, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to be like Tony. I want to be Gary. I want to be, you know, fill in the blank industry. I want to be that, you know? And what I see in them is they're like, it's kind of just like, I want to be this rich, famous entrepreneur, but I don't even know what I want to do. Can you speak on that? Do you see this first of all? And can you speak on that kind of mentality? Cause I don't know about you, but I see it a lot. Uh, that's true. I do see that a lot as well. Uh, because young people due to social media, they only see the end result. Mm -hmm. uh, they see a nice car, they see a nice house, your standard of living and vacations. However, they don't have an idea as to how to get there. Right. And that's one a reason why I also have um, some programming that's offered on my website. Uh, if you are interested in becoming an entrepreneur, well, we can get started. You, you give me a call or you contact me and I'm willing to give you a free consultation. And through that consultation, we will really determine if if it, entrepreneurship is for you. It's not mm -hmm. that uh, glorious as people think. There's <laughs> long hours. Mm -hmm. lots of responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll give you one particular example was when we had the pandemic and um, everything shut down. And we being in a, an essential service, we didn't shut down. We had three days off. We had to figure out how to get the PPE um, to all our employees and find out who actually was coming in because a lot of individuals, they were just afraid and mm -hmm. they said, well, the government's going to pay us to stay home for our safety. So we're going to opt out not showing up. So when you have half your labor force gone, that means the responsibilities, you know, fell on my shoulders and our, the demand for our products surged simply because no products overseas were, were coming in and there were projects on the go and there were timelines. There were people that had to move into their, their homes or in um, their units and that product had to be made. So that meant um, answering phones, uh, providing quotes. Then when the phone wasn't ringing or emails going, you had to go out and make product. And then once you made the product, you had to find out how to deliver it. So it's an incredible amount of responsibility and, and the youth have no idea how mm -hmm. hard it is to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see this kind of mentality of like, uh, you know, let's take me for an example. It's like, oh, wow. Like you have this app and you just like film some workouts real quick. And then you right. just like make money forever on those. And it's like, Technically, yes, but I want to like backtrack you into the years of work, education, application that I had to do to be even able to get there. Then the right. money I had to invest into that, then all the countless hours and in learning how apps mm -hmm. work and all, you know, it's a lot of tedious, not fun work that goes into that. You know, I, the same thing with writing a book, you hear people, oh, I just want to read a book and I'll just have all these book sales right. and blah, blah, blah. It's like, it, you have, no, <laughs> it, it, there is so much work behind the scenes, I think, and business and entrepreneurship that it's like, yeah, sure. On the outside. Great. That's awesome that you can, you know, enjoy a, a life of, you know, abundance at a certain point, but they, it's, right. I think that's the gap. I I don't know. I'm curious your thoughts that I see is like, it's kind of like this. I want something for nothing kind of, you know, I want to just figure out how to beat the game. And it's like, at some point there's going to have to be some strong work ethic and almost scary. I don't know about you, but I've had, I've, I mean, your example there is one of them. It's like some, a lot of scary moments that will push you to your freaking right. limits, you know? So can you speak on the behind the scenes? You know, you gave us an example, but let's say somebody's like, you know, someone's listening to this. They're like, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to start a business. And I actually kind of know what I want to do. I want to go into this or that or that, but I have no idea where to start. What do you say to somebody like that besides doing your consultations that you guys do, but just a general piece of advice, you know? And um, just to, to dial back on a comment you said, um, the youth are very naive when it comes to the business world. And I was a former educator, so a high school teacher. And I had the privilege of teaching um, young minds between 16 and 18 years of age. And the first thing I would ask them, do you have a part-time job? And they would say, no. 
why not? Uh, well, I just go home and everything's there. But don't you want to have a job? A, of course, you're going to make some money, but experience something that um, maybe you like to do. Like, for example, you, you like movies. How about getting a job at a movie theater, checking it out? You know, you could be an usher, you can be in the concession stand, get some experience. And that's the number one thing I would tell the youth. Mm. You need to get some experience. Mm -hmm. um, I personally, I started working at 14 and I was at a theme park that just opened up and it was the new uh, wonder in our neighborhood. And my dad would drive me there because I was 14, I couldn't drive. And I was in charge of a, um, a little food stand. And it was uh, themed uh, uh, after the Flintstones. So it was uh, called um, uh, Pebbles Hot Dogs. So what I had to do was I had to open up in the, in the morning and I would have to prepare all the supplies. And then I would have to start cooking because when 12 o'clock rolled around, um, I figured, oh boy, there's a lot of people. So I learned just from that experience that when people would eat, so I'd track their habits um, and then I would figure out how much food to cook so I didn't waste. And then uh, back in that day, we didn't have uh, all this credit. People paid cash, so you had to handle money. So I, I got the money. And then at the end of the day, ah, we were like minimum wage was was the pittance. It was like $3. And you, <laughs> and you, and you worked uh, eight hours or 10 hours and, and you're bringing home like one day $30. But then you'd have a stack of cash. And you'd say, oh, wow, you know what? I made a lot of money for somebody else. And, and these are the experiences that are lacking with our youth. And, and that's the first taste of entrepreneurship. And, and it doesn't have to be even going to get a job. Like um, my brother and I started mowing lawns in our neighborhood. I was five and my brother's seven years older than me. He's, he was 12. And we'd go knocking on the doors and, hey, could we mow your lawn? Well, how much do you want? Well, back then, if we got five dollars, wow, my brother would and I would split it two fifty each, and from there, you know, we we understood that you put in work, you put in effort, mm -hmm. and you have financial rewards. So, a that would be my first um, mm. a lesson for for young adults mm. is get some experience, and the second thing is get some experience in something you like to do that you can see yourself yeah. passionate about. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. You know, like I'll, I'll use myself as an example. Again, I decided to go into training at, in my early thirties and I got a job at a box gym down the street. And it was a bunch of nice. like 18 to 20 year old guys that decided they were going to be personal trainers. And here I was with a, you know, bachelor's degree and, but making a shift. And I was like, I got to start somewhere. I got to see a lot of bodies move. So, yep, I'm going to get up at 4 a.m. and work for chump change and come back after the lunchtime rush and then come back again at night and work for chump change so I can get some experience, like you said, in learning right. a lot about bodies. And I'll add to this, somebody, I don't remember who it was, some motivational speaker was talking about, like, if you think that you're going to show up differently when you go into business for yourself and you're working for somebody else and you're not showing up at, with your A game, you're kidding yourself because mm -hmm. how you show up in your current job now is exactly how you're going to show up when you start something for yourself. So if you're sitting there in victim mindset and half-assing things and just cutting corners and trying to get, you will do the same thing because guess what? When you start your own thing, there's nobody telling you, you have to do anything. And so exactly. if you are in the pattern of avoiding hard things and, you know, just doing the bare minimum, you might as well, while you're working for somebody else, develop the patterns of showing up in excellence, you know, so that when you do move into your own thing, you already have those patterns developed. So I love those examples. Thank you. And I awesome. also, uh, you made a post today on your only women entrepreneurs account talking about, you know, what it's been like to be a female in an industry, mostly dominated by men. Can you speak on this experience in your professional career? Sure. Uh, I have to go back uh, and just give a little bit of history. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, I, I was a former high school teacher and, um, I decided to do a career change because um, my principles and values were actually clashing with uh, the political environment of the day. They expected me to teach something that I didn't believe in. 
And honestly, I just couldn't face um, my three classes of 30 students each, wonderful kids, great memories. I couldn't lie to them. I really wanted to present the real world uh, and they wouldn't let me. And I was always kind of in the principal's office getting uh, reprimanded. Well, you can't do this. Well, well, why not? I'm just telling them what the world is like based on my experiences growing up. Well, no, we want you to teach this and only this. And it really bothered me. It weighed heavily Mm -hmm. on my heart and was something that I, I, I wanted to do. Uh, but I said, I, I can't, uh, be, I'm, I'm not an actor. Right. Right. So I, I would sit around the table talking over a career change with my parents and, and my in-laws and, uh, my father-in-law just piped up and he said, Hey, you know what? My business, um, it's called Royal door limited. He started in 1975, uh, with a dream. And, uh, he said it's growing, but I don't have the capability of, uh, getting it to a bigger level. So all hands on deck. So my my husband was working there full time. And I kind of said, I don't know if I really want to do this because A, (laughs) it was all men. And and B, I didn't know anything about making custom wood, uh, handmade doors, interior, exterior, nothing. Like I I didn't even know how to read a tape measure. Okay. What's an eighth? What's a 16th? No clue. Right. Right. And he goes, don't worry about that. I will teach you if you're willing to learn. And um, I said, okay, so how long do you think it's going to take? Well, he goes, he goes, well, it depends if you pay attention or not, right? You can whip through it pretty quickly, or it could take you years and we'll just have to play it by ear and, and, and go as and with the flow, right? So it took me about two years to really, really understand all the mechanics of production. And when I first started, you walked onto the shop floor. And uh, I was used to dressing up professionally in, in a dress and looking all nice and pretty. I was wearing blue jeans. I was wearing uh, steel toe boots, uh, safety goggles, gloves, you name it, right? And and I kind of felt a little weird because everybody's staring. And they knew who I was. And they were like, what on earth did she do to be put on the shop floor with the rest of us, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I didn't, I just was polite and... I asked a lot of questions and then I started getting it. I learned different aspects, uh, you know, from ordering raw material, receiving it and then processing it. And then finally, um, you know, my father said, you ready here, here's your first order. I want you to make all these doors on this order. Mm -hmm. And I did from hand, from, from start to finish went off perfectly. And you know what, all the guys like kind of gave me a standing ovation and they kind of bowed down with respect because I convinced them that yes, women can learn the same things as men and they can excel. Mm. Well, I can definitely relate to that one. You know, I just (laughs) today, the day of recording this, I had posted a video um, about just a guy giving me crap about something that I did in a workout once. And um, I was just saying, you know, I really thought about what he said and here's here are my thoughts on it. And some lady commented and she's like, I can't stand it when guys do that. And I was just like, Oh, I mean that as a female in the early 21st century <laughs> in training, when it's still pretty new for women to lift weights, I can so relate. I mean, it's mm-hmm. been a, it's been a thing that I really have had to work through. Cause I'm like, why are these guys being such jerks? You know, it's just like constant. I'm like, you don't even look like you've ever lifted weights in your life. And you're trying to tell me, and I've spent thousands and thousands of dollars and countless hours of education from some of the top coaches in the world. I've traveled all over. I've applied and applied and you're, you're going to sit there you don't even look like you even lift weights. You're going to tell me how to do it. Are you freaking kidding? You know, I get triggered by it. Now I've, I've learned to just let it go, but I've dealt with a lot of that, you know, also, and it's honestly, it's come to the point for me, I don't know about you, but like when I see women do this thing where they like pretend that they can't learn something that men do, like let's say it's something with cars or something with, you know, a grill or something around the house. And like, Mm -hmm. well, men didn't come out of the womb knowing how to fix that pipe either. When men didn't come out of the womb, knowing how cars work, they just applied themselves and learned and got curious. It's like, we can do that too, you know? And I'm sure the same thing could apply for, um, for men with, you know, classic female roles, but 
Um, I think that's a huge thing to take note of for women and entrepreneurship is like these old ways of thinking only work if we agree. So if it's like, well, you know, men do that or men are better at that, that that only works if you are in that belief system. But mm-hmm. when we overcome that, just like you did, and you said it took time, years, yes. years, yes. right? But like, yes. it's, it's not like we can't learn things. And that, that was a lesson I learned in business. Like really early, I was like, wow, I actually noticed as a female that I did have some deep belief systems that I needed to take a look at of like, men are better at this just from my upbringing. Men are better. Men are, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. more business savvy. Men are more, you know, better at training. Like those were belief systems that I had to take a look at. And so I appreciate you bringing that up because I think women going into entrepreneurship are going to need to take a look at some of those deep core belief systems of their own capabilities. Oh, absolutely. And it it stems back going, giving everyone a little bit of a history lesson, going back to the world wars. um, Okay. The U S wasn't involved as much as uh, the rest of the world, but just in Canada, um, our men were called to arms and they abandoned the factories uh, women were usually um, the homemakers. Very few women actually worked outside of the home. It was usually um, single women and they had clerical jobs, office jobs. But skilled trades, no, no, no. It was seen as a no, no, like blue collar. Uh, it was a, a, a derogatory tor- term and they didn't want to affiliate women there. It's just for immigrants and people that had low education skills. And when they went off to Europe to fight, uh, well, the economy couldn't run by itself. So the government had a call to arms. Hey, we need women to work in the canning factories and the fisheries. We need them to do um, munitions um, manufacturing. So they did uh, things that they never knew anything about. First time experience. They had great exposure. And because of that collaborative effort, we ended up being victors of both world wars. So that proves that women are able to do Mm -hmm. whatever they want to do, right? It's just a matter of mindset. But the the issue Mm -hmm. that came up was after the the, the World Wars, uh, women were kind of hushed and put back into the home. Oh, no, no, no. You you can't work in the munitions factory. You can't uh, work as an airplane mechanic because, well, the men came back. Just go back in uh, to the home, take care of the family. And we kind of accepted that. And then the other mm-hmm. stereotype that um, is still prevailing is the belief that women are um, not mentally capable of doing well in math and science. Um, so hence, we are correcting that at the moment. There is um, a big movement in North America and almost worldwide. It's called STEM. Have you heard of that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. I've got school right. kids. <laughs> so yeah, you, you've got your science, your technology, mm-hmm. engineering, and your your math, right? Mm-hmm. And women are actually excelling. They're getting the opportunities to do these um, uh, jobs that were once male dominated. So it's just reversing this uh, mm-hmm. these stereotypes that were enacted years ago. Yeah. And really we as women are the only ones who can really undo those. I don't think that there's just like a bunch of guys out there that are like trying to hold us down. It's not that Mm -hmm. it's just, we've inherited these belief systems. And when we play as women, we're like, yep, can't do that. Can't do that. Can't do that. Because we haven't ever questioned those inherited belief systems. That's how it keeps perpetuating. Cause I don't know that many men that like even think in the way of like, I'm not going to respect her in this industry because she's a woman very much, you know, like if if I think of other colleagues, if if you're good, they respect you. It's just, you know, men are pretty, (laughs) pretty good that way. Most, (laughs) most of the ones I know, you know, and so, but it's us that we can hold ourselves back. And this is something that we really have to look at as women right now. Um, A quick side note, I'll share that my mom, was like a pioneer in women's running. And when she uh, was in high school, she ran the mile so fast in PE class that they put her on the boys track team because there was no uh, wow. girls track team yet. And a couple That's of the incredible. boys did quit. This is back in the <laughs> 1960s because they didn't want a girl to beat them. So there was some of that, you know, and mm. then they, t- they made a girl's team for her the next year. And she ended up being one of the top 10 female track athletes in in the United States and went Incredible. on to the Olympic trials. She didn't qualify because they didn't even have her event yet because it was so new. 
But in that same time period, there were, I forgot this woman's name now. I feel bad, but it was the first woman who ran the Boston Marathon. So if you're unfamiliar with the Boston Marathon, you have to uh, qualify for the Boston Marathon. Yes. It's the most prestigious, longest standing marathon in the United States. And this woman snuck in under initials and kind of dressed herself like a man and snuck in. And what the craziest part of that story to me is that this, and this was right around the same time. I, it was the same period that my mom was running in the late sixties. Mm-hmm. They believe they didn't let women run the Boston marathon because they believed that their uterus would fall out if they ran that far. And that was just the accepted belief system. And yes. this lady was like, yeah. mm. I'm going to do it. And then they found out in the middle of the race that she was a woman. And they actually have this iconic picture of one of the guys working the marathon in a truck, like raging mad, like trying to get her. And her boyfriend was like this big, you know, football player and was like pushing him off. And she said, in that moment, I knew that I, if I had to crawl across that finish line, I was going to do it because this was way more than just about me. I knew in that moment that I was representing all women, you know, and I share that story in light of this conversation because that I do, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel that way, especially as a woman in the training industry, it's like, I am representing like we, you know, if we, as women want to be equal. Like we have to see that in ourselves. We have to own our own intelligence, our own strength versus playing into the same roles of like, I'm just going to show my butt uh, as a freaking trainer, because that's what girls do on Instagram. You know, I had to make a lot of those choices. And in any industry, you're serious. Like, well, I could play this helpless. Like, well, I'm a, I'm a female, so I can't do that stuff. Like if we play by those rules, then it doesn't change. So we are the ones that actually have to do our own work and change is how I see it. Yeah, and, that, and that's why um, one of the reasons I started the uh, the podcast and oh, because this message has to get out. It's not getting out in the school systems, unfortunately. They have a different uh, agenda altogether. But um, I I am an older woman that's been established, and and anyone else that's in my situation, I think it's a, a social obligation for us to share the message, speak to other women, because the only way that we're going to tap into this generation is through social media. Mm-hmm. And it's important that we share our stories and let young women know, hey, the, the power is in your hands. And, and my favorite um, quote is, you are your own impact. Mm. Nobody else is going to determine who you are and who you can become. It's all in your hands. Right. What do you think are some of the things that hold young women back the most in terms of stepping into that? Again, we'll have to go back to stereotypes. And uh, I'll give you an example. Personally, like when I was growing up, my, my parents came to the country with a grade five education, didn't speak a word of English. And they had to work at the lowliest blue collar jobs imaginable. And and they were abused in the fact that, you know, they'd work 50 hours, they'd pay them for 40 hours. Um, They were always paid considerably less than, um, you know, uh, native born Mm. uh, individuals. And all, all I heard was, you know, my parents didn't complain. They just made me aware. They said, the best thing you can do is you educate yourself wow. and and be vocal, okay? And they they were at a disadvantage for n- numerous years. Mm-hmm. But as they um, gained skills and they learned the language, they started climbing up. So we went from working poor family, and my parents ended up in upper middle class. And it was just from, you know, experience and them telling me, Oh, sorry about this. I didn't think this would go off. My no my CGM. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so um yeah, going back back to my parents, uh it, they were they were the ones that instilled it on me. But the, the, the biggest issue we're having is families are no longer intact. You know, a, a lot of kids are are going home and, and there's nobody home. So what's the best uh, friend they have is social media. Mm-hmm. Right. And mm-hmm. uh, the, the, what is being put on social media is not all that good. 
So we have to kind of counteract that. So if, if, if you don't have a stable home environment and, and you don't have a school environment that's conducive to, you know, um, putting in the work and, and, and getting an education, then what's left? Mm -hmm. the, the internet and social media. So that's the only way that I can see young women starting to pick up and see these ideas. Because once you see examples like, like Tara and, and what she did to, to become the woman she is now, what Rosemary did and, and, and all the other women that you've interviewed and spoke to, those are the samples that will probably get young minds to start opening up and, and say, Hey, you know what? I don't have to go on, you know, Instagram and take uh, nudies or, you know, <laughs> pictures of me in a bikini. And, and because honestly speaking, that all that works when you're in your twenties, when you're in your fifties and everything goes down to gravity, it's not going to work as well. Well, and work in what way, you know, think about the results you're really going to get from that in your life. Is that really what you want? And I will add to what you're saying. I think it is so profound because for me, like, I mean, I grew up the youngest of five kids with a single mom with mental health issues, working part-time at UPS and going back to school. Right. And like, I had no healthy habits at all modeled for me. I had no, definitely no like money management business, like nothing like that at all modeled for me. And there is a choice. I, I will say part of the reason that I do choose to do social media, because I've had my ups and downs. Trust me. Sometimes I'm like, you know what? Forget it. I'm sick of dealing with all this. Because when you start really growing on a platform, you get a lot of crap, a lot. And it's just annoying. Sometimes, no matter how much work you've done, it's just like, do I really have to see all this negative crap coming in my face every day? You know? And the reason I choose to say on there is because social media and books and YouTube and all of that, they changed my life. That's how I learned. And right. I will add like, it is up to us when I hear people say that they hate social media or that social media is like, you know, ruining their lives. It's like, well, there's a victim mindset in that because mm -hmm. we are choosing what we right. consume and how much we consume it. We're not helpless victims that we just have to be on social media. So what I did when I was really going into business was I took that quote from Jim Rohn, the five people you hang around most are the people yes. you become like. And I didn't have people like that in my actual life at that, not really, to hang around all the time that I wanted to learn business from. So I just started nonstop listening to books on Audible, every single great mind I could think of. YouTube, you know, there were some random entrepreneurship free course on YouTube. Cool. I don't care who you are. You mm -hmm. know more than I do. I'm doing it. There's this whole thing. Oh, it's a Saturday night. Yep. I'm doing this random dude's entrepreneurship course that he put on YouTube for free. Like I was hungry, you know, and anything that I could. And so that consumption, well, it worked. I learned a lot of stuff. And of course, then I got to a point where I could start actually investing and like hiring coaches right. and mentors and things. But that's how I started was just, okay, I can afford this you know, $12 audible credit. I've heard this is one of the greatest books on wealth mindset ever written. Let's go. And I'll listen to it as many times as I have to, you know? And exactly. so that I think is, um, I hear from you, like those of us who have, um, been like, so gifted, I guess, on our life journeys, the ability mm -hmm. to change our lives and expand and learn business or learn health or like whatever it is, it is beautiful. It's not like you have to, but it is beautiful if you're willing to share and, you know, reach back your hand and, and, and help others. And then if you're on the needing help end of things, it's like, we'll reach out and grab the hand. Cause there's a lot of us out there. So you can sit there and you can follow mindless accounts or, you know, yeah. Vain nudie ish pictures yeah. and, yeah. you know, angry, emotionally instigating people and all of that. Or you can choose to use social media to your advantage and really change your life. So you can change your whole life for free on for the sure. internet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and I appreciate you being part of that. <laughs> likewise. Uh, and just to touch on that social media. And when I started the podcast, like I have four adult children and um, three boys and a daughter. And my daughter was the one that said, mom, you should go for it because, you know, most of my friends, they're the lost generation. Like she's, she's fine. She's got it. Like mm -hmm. she works full time. She's like a workhorse, very mm -hmm. independent. And my boys are like, mom, who's going to listen to that? 
why would you even bother? And <laughs> he goes, that's going to be nonsense, right? And and I said, you know what? Just watch me. So mm-hmm. when I started reaching out to my personal connections first, um, out of 100 people that I asked, I only had one person that said a flat out no. Mm. The 99 people that said yes, very busy, busy, successful women. And, and they all volunteered to, to help out. So the first lesson is, like you said, ask for help because there's always someone that's going to mm-hmm. give you that time, that advice that is mm-hmm. going to change your life. Mm-hmm. And the, the one person that said no to me, and I did, I, I kind of expected that, but I wanted to actually give this a um, person an opportunity, a very young person. I, I see her has a rising, shining star. But unfortunately, um, her parents do not like me because of who I am. Uh, I'm successful and I'm very confident in what I do. And they go, no, 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 you don't want to be like Rosemary, none at all. And they kind of convinced their young daughter not to you know, participate in the podcast. And, and I kind of said to her, you know, it's a shame that you're not going to share your story and encourage young women your age, Mm -hmm. but it's a bigger shame for you not connecting because the, the possibilities and opportunities that you are missing out Mm -hmm. could be life changing. Mm -hmm. And, and I just left it with that. Yeah. I love this. Um, insight you're sharing, because I've definitely learned that too. I used to be more in this, what would I say? Uh, all in all out labeling people as I want to be like that, or I don't want to be like that, like all good or all bad, you know, and you learn over time. It's like, you know, one time I did a mindset, uh, I had, I hired a mindset coach and he did this test with me that the guy who created it had won a Nobel prize for like being able to understand people's psychology by looking into what Hitler did in Germany wow. and then saying, how did he, how did he understand how people operated and created this test and to be able to use that for good? And it's like that, that's what I mean by like, there's, there is just completely closing off and saying no. While of course, yeah, we can do that if we want to, mm-hmm. I have learned there's so much benefit and it's like, It's like, what can I learn from this person or this opportunity instead of just completely shutting myself off? You know, if there's one lesson I've learned in business, like don't completely shut yourself (laughs) off or it's going to suck real bad. (laughs) Well, don't burn your bridges, right? Right, right. And there's always something to learn from from everyone and every experience. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my heart does ache for this young lady because, you know, she's really smart. She's brilliant. And, but she's struggling. She's mm. struggling out there because she's not allowed to make those connections. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a shame. And then yeah. the, the thing is going back to what you said that you didn't like being on social media, you're always going to have haters, but the haters are the people that, uh, deep down, they want to be you, Yeah, but they don't want, they can't, they don't know what steps to take to become mm. similar to you. And Mm -hmm. that's the only way that they feel good about it is Mm -hmm. to hate on you or anybody Mm -hmm. that has, you know, some positivity or radiance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I've seen that, observed that. And, you know, just a lot of other people that I know that have large audiences on social media is what I perceive is that people have that initial, I want to be like that, even if it's really imperceptible. And then quickly find all the reasons that there's something wrong with that person to protect myself from feeling less than, Oh, that's why I'm not like her. That's why I'm not like him because they're a jerk. Cause they cheat on their wife because they blah, blah, blah. They, they don't love their kids. They have an eating disorder. You know, it's just like these really mm-hmm. protective, like snap judgments that happen. So, yeah. Um, but I think, you know, um, if, as we, take ownership over what we are consuming. Like that's, I don't just scroll through the TV. I don't listen to the radio. Mm -hmm. I take ownership over what I am consuming and you can massively increase your quality of life by doing that. And so speaking of that, let's get into, so you're, (laughs) Oh, only women entrepreneurs, you call it. Oh, yes. 
Okay. I love it. So O W E O. So, um, let's talk a little bit more about the show. You just released your first episode at the time of us recording this. So make yes. sure you guys check that out. There should be several by the time you hear this. And, um, is it only women entrepreneurs.com is the website? Yes. Okay. And so on that, if, if, it's, it's only women, sorry guys, but right. <laughs> I'm assuming that's the name, but if they want to do a consultation, they can learn more about how to do that through that only women entrepreneurs.com. Right. Yep. There's a, a section where you can just click on for a free consultation and then you, you schedule it on my calendar and, um, we'll give you a call. We'll have a, a half hour chat on to see if you want to change your career or if you want nice. to become an entrepreneur. So awesome. So needed. I would have loved to have found that when I was early on. I'm like, I don't know <laughs> what to do at all. And I will take any help I can get. <laughs> um, so that is so awesome. And also I was a guest on your podcast. So watch for that. If you guys go subscribe yes. to the yes, podcast. It'll be dropping soon and, and, and I'll let you know, we'll, we'll actually um, advise. We'll give you some uh, heads up when it does drop. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'll share that for sure as well. And all right. Final pieces of final one piece of advice. You're a young woman. You want to become an entrepreneur. What pops into your head? Uh, dream really big. Mm. Uh, and I'll tell you how big you're going to have to dream. Okay. When I was a kid, uh, not only did I say I was going to be an entrepreneur, but I was going to be a successful one. And then I put a dollar amount on it. <laughs> so I didn't say 1 million. I didn't say 10 million. I said, I want to hit at least a hundred million. Love it. And you know what? We're going north of that. So you so dream awesome. big. And when you were young, you did that way before you even started. When I was very young. Wow. I just, I just knew Amazing. it was going to happen because we live in the best countries of the world. Mm. Okay. And the opportunities are there. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and if you don't capitalize on those opportunities, it's on you. There's no yeah. excuse. Yeah. Right. You, you've, you've got free education. There's lots of scholarships. I mm -hmm. did my university on a scholarship. My parents could afford to pay it, but I had all my five years paid for on a scholarship. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. And I took every opportunity that was given to me. Mm. And wherever I got stuck, I looked for help. And there is always somebody willing to help us on that. Amazing. Yeah. I love that. That that belief, you know, I, it's the only thing you're exactly right. I mean, especially if you're living in the United States or Canada or some, some of the other countries mm -hmm. that are doing really well, it is just your own lack of belief. There is no reason that if other people can gain wealth that you can't except for your own lack of belief in that. So yeah, I love that. Absolutely. advice and that example. All right, Rose, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you so much. We'll link up um, the podcast, the website. We've got a mindset program together. Thank you for featuring that on through only women You're entrepreneurs. Welcome. So we'll link that up and um, your uh, social media as well. So you guys awesome. can make sure you check Thank the you show so notes much. to find that. All right, and thanks, I, I look forward to uh, working with you. We've yes. got a lot of good things that are going to happen. I've got great plans and I'm going to fill you in soon. <laughs> Woohoo. 